you to everyone. Please unmute yourself as you wish. Um, we're looking again at Daf Mem Vav Amit Beis in Mesechet Sukkah. And uh, one second. And um, we are towards the top, just before we uh, re-emerge on the page, a very quick um, summary of what we were dealing with previously. The Gomorrah got into the topic of making brachot. Um, and um, we discussed all sorts of questions as to how many brachas are necessary um, for sitting in the sukkah and also taking lulav and esrik. Do we say that one bracha at the very first opportunity suffices for the whole yonta, or do we make one on each occasion? And we asked that question both in relation to our minim, whether a daily bracha is needed or just the one on the first day. And we also asked, asked it in relation to um, uh, the sukkah itself, whether just the first night would be sufficient. Anyway, we, we know what we do in practice, which is to make a brocha on each opportunity. After that, the Gemara went into some similar topic on brochas, but on a more general basis. And uh, it posed the question that if a person has a series of mitzvot to perform, and he's going to do so uh, consec consecutively, in short order, should he make a brach on each of those mitzvot one at a time, or should he only make a general type brach or a para brach at the beginning, at the beginning of the sequence on the first mitzvah, al ha mitzvah, without specifying uh, which mitzvah, because it's going to relate to the whole sequence of mitzvahs. Maybe one is sufficient. Now, if you're doing them separately and they're intervals, then clearly you would make a bracha for each. But supposing you were going to sit down, uh, you're going to put your talis on immediately, your tefillin on immediately, take lulav and esrik, um, and you're going to do this in, in, in a, uh, um, a closely packed sequence. Maybe one bracha, a general bracha, ahead of all of them would be good enough. Or maybe you should make one each for each bracha. Now, again, we know what we do in practice because the Gemara discussed that the locha is and we make a brach on each of those mitzvahs. But we did talk about why there might be a problem with that, why the Gemara even considered the possibility that a single preceding bracha is all that should be made. And we talked about how sensitive we are to reciting Hashem's name unnecessarily, um, to, to take Hashem's name, um, uh, not necessarily sharp, but uh, without a particular purpose. A bracha she'enot sricha, a bracha which isn't absolutely necessary, very sparing in using our Kodesh Baruch Hu's name, Baruch HaTar Hashem Elokeinu Melachon, which is what gives rise to the possibility that a single bracha at the beginning is a safer bet than making a whole series of Baruch HaTar Hashem sequentially. In practice, we've dismissed that concern and we make a bracha for each, for each and every mitzvah that we do. And we make the particular bracha, the bracha on the talis, the bracha on tefillin, the bracha on, on the lulav and esrog, and so on. Okay, that's really where, where we, um, we got to as far as halacha is concerned. The Gemara went on to a little bit of agada, and it talked about how you build up knowledge and how you have to listen to mitzvahs. Um, it was a sort of tangential point that the Gemara brought um, in the wake of the named Rabbonim uh, who we were dealing with before it brought some other agadic passage. We, we also then started a section which dealt with muktsa, and I'm going to look at that again, um, because there's a form of muktsa that very much applies to a sukkah and also to a an esrik, not necessarily the type of muktsa that we normally refer to, which, which we're so familiar, which relates to Shabbos activities, there's something muktsa and Shabbos. There's a related din of muktsa, and the Gemara got into that, and it got into that because of a uh, a passage at the end of the, a Mishnah that we dealt with, where we read the Mishnah quite a number of months ago. And I reminded you of that uh, passage, and we started to learn this. And the whole subject of Mukta is quite a complicated topic. It's also quite an interesting topic because it's a very um, architectural topic. There are a number of different categories. The categories are well constructed. Um, what type of Mukta are we dealing with? What are the halachas in relation to that type of Mukta? Why should something be mukt? So it's actually quite an interesting topic in itself. I'm going to look at this piece of Gemara again. So I'm really going to start with you um, from 
uh, if you've got your Memvav Ahmed Beit, I'm going to start with you near the top, first two, three, four, five, six lines uh, from the top of the page. The first word of the line there is Tishma. Um, and uh, then there are two dots. And really where we're going to start with is the word Miyad. And Miyad Tanokas Bechulu. So this is a quote from the Mishnah, which the Gemara is going to discuss. And it's got nothing to do with brochos anymore. We've moved away from brochos and we're moving in to the topic of when can you, if you like, eat the esrig when you've done your final um, brocha on the uh, esrig. You're not likely to want to eat the lulav, but you may be wanting to eat the etrog. And similarly, when can you begin to play around with items that are on the sukkah after sukkot as well? Um, clearly you can at some point in time, but can you do so immediately? You, you've said goodbye to the sukkah, or what is the halacha? So we, we'll have a look at that. I'm just going to share a screen because as I did last time, I want to share with you the, um, the passage in the Mishnah, which is not quoted fully uh, in the Gemara here. And you just said, Miyatinokos. And you can see <clears throat> the passage over here um, that I've highlighted. The Mishnah made this point at, the, at almost the last few words of a lengthy Mishnah. Miyatinokos, from the small children, Shom Tinus of Levehem. We, we snatch away their lulovim, ba'ochlin esrogehen, and we eat their esrogim. So again, this is, this is not a, the clearest passage in terms of what it is leading up to, but the context is <clears throat> the mission is dealing with the last day of Sukkot, uh, not Shemini Atzeris, which is another yontif in itself, but the last day of Sukkot, the seventh day, a person has already made his brach on the lulav and esrog, and uh, he's finished, therefore, if you like, his mitzvah observance of the Lulav and Esrik. You know, it's the time you say goodbye, Lulav and Esrik. But it's still 11 o'clock in the morning or the last day of Sukkot. So the Mishnah tells us what we can and what we can't do at this point in time in relation to that Lulav and Esrik. Miyatinokos, we can take them away from the hands of the children. Why, why does it say children over here? That's going to be quite a key word. For the moment, just be neutral about it. And as far as children's concerned, maybe it means from adults as well. <clears throat> Be deliberately neutral. But it does say from, chin, from children, we take from their hands, show them to the Luvehen, we can take the lulav that they were playing with. They weren't necessarily playing. They were using lulav and esrik themselves. There's a mitzvah of chinuch, right, of educating a child. And you have a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old who had his own lulav and esrik. And you may now take the lulav away and you may eat their esrogim. And the Mishnah says that you may do this immediately. As soon as that mitzvah is over um, and, um, and it's 11 o'clock in the morning, you may take the lulav away from them, put it on the side, and more than that, you may actually make use of the esrog and you can eat the esrog even, which means it's not muktza anymore. That's the statement which this missionary seems to be making. And we're going to um, bring back this statement in the missionary and when we bring it as a question to a halachic argument. But it would seem to be saying that as soon as the mitzvah is done, the esrog is no more out of bounds. You may do with it what you want. I mean, you're unlikely to want to play football with it. It would be a bit of a disgrace. But if you wanted to make jam, you could make jam that uh, very afternoon of uh, the last day of Sukkot. That's what it seems to be saying. Okay, so let me just stop sharing a moment. <clears throat> so let's carry on. So the, um, the Gemara then make, brings a statement on Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan said, and here we're going to have a machloket between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lokish. They're usually sparring partners in terms of halacha. One will always say X and the other one will normally say Y. And the Gemara will always say, why does, why does one say X and the other one say Y? And bring questions to try and prove Rabbi Yochanan's point or Reish Lokish's point. This is standard chess move. So let's just take it over here in this specific Gemara. On Rabbi Yochanan, Esrog, Bashvi Oso, Bashmini Muta, said Rabbi Yochanan, Ignore what you learned in the Mishnah a moment ago. Rabbi Yochanan said that the Esrog is going to be asor, forbidden, 
to make use of the whole of the seventh day of Yom Tif of Sukkot. And you may only make use of it on the eighth day, which is Shemini Atzeris. It's not a big deal that you can make use of it on the eighth day because it's not, not Sukkot anymore. But that even after you've done your mitzvah with the Esrik and it's 11 o'clock, contrary to what we said we learned in the Mishnah, that Esrik remains out of bounds the whole day until night. It is, in other words, it is muktzah, it remains muktzah. And then we will look at this, what do we really mean by muktzah? But let's just see what the opposing view is. But first he contrasts that with sukkah. Sukkah, bashmini of sukkah. The sukkah is even muktzah on the eighth day. Look, I'm not gonna to spend too long on the case of sukkah. The Gemara is gonna ask why there's a difference. So over here, what, the, what, what Rabbi Yochan is saying, even though you may now eat your Esrig on the eighth day, Shmini Atzeres. Why? Because the Yont of the Sukkot is over and it's not out of bounds anymore. When it comes to the Sukkot, it remains out of bounds. Why should it be out of bounds? Shmini Atzeres is also a separate Yont of. When it comes to the end of the eighth, the seventh day of Sukkot, if you're allowed to already to play with your Esrig, why can't you play with your Sukkot? But there's a difference according to Rabbi Yochum. The Gemara is going to ask the questions to why they should be different. But what do we mean about the sukkah being out of bounds? I don't mean that you can't go in. Didn't mean that. When the Gemara talks about sukkah and muktzah in relation to sukkah, when can you use it again? It means when can you make use of the materials of the sukkah? That's what we mean. In, in the same way as with esrig, we're talking about can you eat the esrig and do various, can you, if you like, use the esrig in a different way? The, when it comes to sukkah, the question is, can you use the constructed sukkah in a different way? And it doesn't mean sitting in there. It means taking it apart. It means, moreover, even if you can't take it apart, because after all the eight days, Shemini Atzeris, and you can't take a hammer and nail even on, on Shemini Atzeris. Supposing a bit of the sukkah fell down, and it fell down on the fifth day. The halakha is actually... You have to be very careful. You can, you can fix it again if you need to, but it remains muktza for the whole of Yom Tov because why? In other words, you can't use it for firewood. You can't use it for any other purpose. You can't say, well, you know what? A plank of my sukkah fell down. My sukkah seems to be standing pretty well without it. I'm cold in the house, so I can use this plank as firewood. You're not allowed to do that. It's muktza. Why is it muktza? Because of this concept, as we'll see again, of huktza and mitzvah. The very fact that you've dedicated this esrog, or you've dedicated this in the case of the sukkah, this plank of wood that was embedded in the sukkah for the purposes of sukkah means it can't be used for any other purpose during sukkot. So you might have thought when sukkah is, God is over on the eighth day, Shmini Atzeris, now I can use it for firewood, I'm allowed to burn things, or I may use it for some other reason, a doorstop or something to lean on as a walking stick or whatever, why not? It's not Sukkot anymore, says Rabbi Yochanan, no. Even on the eighth day, Shemini Atzeris, it's still Moktzah. Obviously, when it comes to the weekday again, nothing is Moktzah. But, but at least that eighth day, it remains Moktzah. And this is an anomaly that the Gemara will question. So this is Rabbi Yochanan. Now, Reish Lokish has a different opinion. And he says, Esrog afilu bishvashvi'i nami muta. He doesn't argue with Sukkot. Let's just concentrate on Esrog. Whereas Rabbi Yochanan said that the Esri is only permitted at the end of the seventh day, Reish Lokish is more makel, he's lenient. He says, no. He says, 11 o'clock in the morning, you finished your bracha, you put the lul of an Esri down, you can actually do whatever you want. The Esri is now fully in function again for whatever purpose you want. You don't have to wait to the end of the seventh day. So let me just um, go back to sharing my screen where we will see those two views. So <clears throat> Rabbi Yochanan says the Esrog is Muktza till the end of day seven. And Reish Lokish says the Esrog is permitted immediately after use on day seven. So that's the subtle argument uh, between, between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lokish. So the Gemara says, and I just stop sharing a moment. The Gemara then goes on to say, but my komiflegi, what is the rationale behind their argument? Why does Rabbi Yochanan say you've got to wait till the end of the seventh day? And Reish Lokish say that you may start to eat your esrig if you like, or make use of it immediately after you've done the mitzvah. So the Gemara says, Ma sova le mitzvah sa is ketsoi, u ma sova 
Lokule Yoma Iskatsoi. They argue in principle about the found fundamental uh, rationale of uh, muktsa when it comes to a mitzvah. According to um, Reish Lokish, Reish Lokish is the one who says that you may eat it straight away after the mitzvah has been, the final mitzvah has been performed. He holds the mitzvah so is What does that mean? It is only muktsa while it is in use for a mitzvah. In other words, you cannot use it for anything else other than the mitzvah, right? It doesn't mean you can't use it, otherwise you haven't got a lul of an esrik. It's not muktsa, it means it is dedicated solely to the purposes of lul of an esrik. So as long as that mitzvah is still incumbent on you, you cannot use it for anything else. But it's only that for those moments. The moment that you finished with the mitzvah aspect, you've done your last bracha, on the Lulav and Esrik on the seventh day, it becomes free. It is not muktzah anymore. The muktzah evaporates immediately that you've completed the mitzvah. That's Reish Lakish. And Rabbi Yochanan, he holds, Umar, the other one, this is Rabbi Yochanan holds, the Kula Yoma is Ketsoi. The din of muktzah, even for a mitzvah, is that once it became muktzah at the beginning of the day, it remains muktzah until the end of the day. It's a blanket rule. It's got nothing to do with saying, well, I finished my mitzvah, so why should it be mitzvah anymore? That's Reish Lakish. Rabbi Yochanan holds, no, there's a din. The din is something remains mitzvah until the end of the day. So even though you have finished with a mitzvah, it remains mitzvah for the end of the day. Now, this obviously was the underlying difference between them, but this is a principal disagreement. And if I just share the screen again, Here's the famous uh, statement, which really um, is being espoused by, uh, put forward by um, uh, Rabbi Yochanan. Uh, it's a statement you find in the Shabbos, uh, quoted many times. Migu de iskatsoi levein hashmoshos, iskatsoi lekuliyom. Iskatsoi means it's muktzah. Something that was muktzah at nightfall, at the beginning of the day, ben hashmoshos is nightfall. It's 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 between uh, sunset and, and three stars, if you like, during that intermediate period where it's hardly night and hardly day, it's the Sophic Yom, Sophic Lila, actually, there's a sort of Sophic as to whether Halak is night or day, Moshos, this time of nightfall, then if it has been Mukta at nightfall, then it remains Mukta for the whole day, in other words, into the night and the whole of the next day. And this is precisely the room we all know when it comes to Shabbos. This is the statement that underlies the whole principle of Mukta and Shabbos. And it's a straightforward rule. We know that if something was Mukta on Friday afternoon, just before Shabbos came in, you say that's, if, in other words, if it was out of action, you can't use it at all. So you have a Shabbos candles, uh, even though they've gone out, essentially they remain Mukta until Mokta Shabbos. We don't say when the minute they go out, right, you can use these Shabbos candles to juggle with or whatever. They remain properly Mokta. You shouldn't handle them even because they, was, they were hooked to the mitzvah. They were dedica dedicated to the mitzvah. And this principle suggests that once they dedicated to the mitzvah, when Shabbos came in, when they were burning, when you were really were using them, they, these candlesticks remain Mokta all the way through till the end of the day. That's the standard principle. And Rabbi Yochanan is just using the same principle when it comes to describing um, when you can make use of your esrik on the final day of uh, Sukkot. He's saying, well, was it not Mokta on the, on the uh, nightfall of the seventh day? Yes, it was. Well, it was mukta on the fine night for the seventh day. In other words, you couldn't use it for anything other than the mitzvah purpose for the next morning. Then it remains mukta all the way to the end of the seventh day uh, until the the, the motzei yontif, essentially, of Sukkot. That's Rabbi Yochanan. But Reish Lakish doesn't hold this in relation to mukta le mitzvah. He holds that when it comes to hooks and mitzvah, you only take it as far as the performance of the mitzvah and not to the end of the day. That's, that would be Reish Lokish's view. It's, most of the Rishonim agree that Reish Lokish does not agree, disagree about the general categories of Muktza. For example, most of the Muktzas we deal with are, are Muktzas which certainly last the whole of Shabbos. If you can't use a, a pneumatic drill when 
at dusk or at sunset on Friday afternoon, it doesn't suddenly magically evaporate as much as sometime at three o'clock in the Shabbos afternoon. It remains all the way through to Moetzer Shabbos because the, I, the reason that those muktzas exist are because you're dealing with items which, which, which normally are used for a malacha. And therefore they, they last all the way through as being muktzah. Don't use them. Don't even move them unnecessarily until Moetzer Shabbos. But Reish Lagish holds when it comes to the principle of a muktza, which isn't that type of muktza, but it's only muktza because it's dedicated for a mitzvah, and therefore it's hooked to the mitzvah, which means it is allocated to that mitzvah purpose only, that can evaporate straight away as soon as that final mitzvah is done, and is the exception in terms of muktza. That's Reish Lagish's opinion. Rabbi Yochanan says it's, it's the same rule. Was it, was it muktza at sunset? on the evening before, and if it was, it, it is muktza all the way through um, to um, uh, Motsei Yonta. Okay, let me stop uh, sharing a moment. So we've explained this basic difference between Rabbi Yochan and Reish Lokish on when can you eat the esrik, if you like. When does the esrik become free for any other usage? Is it immediately after the mitzvah, or do you have to wait till the end of the day? So here the Gemara is going to bring the, the snippet of Mishnah I brought earlier on, Shomtid, where you, you can take away the lulav from your little child, or you can eat the esrig of your child, what we quoted, and it's going to say, hang on, that is only going to work out according to Reish Lakish, not according to Rabbi Yochanan. This appears to be a proof for Reish Lakish. So let's do it inside the Gemara. The Gemara says, Asave. A kasha was asked, Reish Lokish le Rabbi Yochanan. Reish Lokish posed the following question to Rabbi Yochanan. Reish Lokish is of the view that as soon as you have performed your final mitzvah by minim, you may make use of the esrit. Rabbi Yochanan says, no, you have to wait until the end of the seventh day. Says Reish Lokish to Rabbi Yochanan, I have to be right. You have to be wrong. Read this Mishnah in Sukkah and you'll see this Sukkah sides with me. What did the Mishnah say? It said, Shomtin um, es lulavehem, but ochlin es esrogehem. So we go back again um, to the uh, words of the Mishnah that I showed you before here. Miyatu noko, Shomtin es lulavehem, but ochlin es This is a statement that applied in the Mishnah immediately after you've performed the last mitzvah. What does it say? It says that you may immediately take that lulav away from the young kids and you may eat their esrogim. Well, that certainly shows that if one of these two is correct, it is um, Rabbi Yochanan. Who is the one who said you can eat immediately the mitzvah is done? Rabbi Yochanan. Reish Lokish says you have to wait, wait until the end of the day. Well, this possible, this Mishnah extract says that you don't have to wait till the end of the day. You may eat it straight away. So it seems to be a score point here um, uh, for Reish Lokish against Rabbi Yochan. Rabbi Yochan would say you have to wait for the whole day. So that's the Gemara. Now, hang on a moment. You might say, hang on, this is no proof. Because we have an ambiguity in the Mishnah. We are now going to discuss this ambiguity. And it's this word, Tinokus, that I, 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 I highlighted. Because for a moment, let's just stand back. This whole question of whether the lulav or the esrig is muktza, how long is it muktza, how long is it not muktza, when can you start eating it? Why should it have anything to do with whether the arba minim set belongs to your child or your own? Are we not here discussing what you are allowed to do after your mitzvah? And the Mishnah would, would seem to be informing you that after the mitzvah is done, ochlin esres rogim, why should you only be able to uh, eat the esrogim of your kids and not your own. If you say the mix and that the muktza evaporates as soon as the mitzvah is done, it evaporates over your own adult esrog as well. What has it got to do with the fact that it's the esrog of your child? Why on earth has the Mishnah added this very disturbing word, tinokos, which spoils the whole scenario and makes us think it's only the child's esrog which is allowed? In other words, we will see this is going to be the crux of a difference of opinion between Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lokish. Do we take the word Tinoko seriously? You might say that's a strange thing to ask. It's in the Mishnah. We take everything in the Mishnah very seriously. But, but this is going to be the crux. 
sometimes we find that a Mishnah puts in a scenario, describes the scenario of a case and gives us a halacha, even though that same halacha might apply in other scenarios as well. Why did the Mishnah choose that scenario? Because it's the normal scenario you come across in the, in the real world. You don't talk about flying cows. You talk about flying planes, right? Who do you normally snatch things from straight away something's over? A kid. It doesn't mean that the Mishnah is dedicated to teach you our locha about kids. It's using the example, but maybe it means the same for adults as well. That's one possible interpretation of this Mishnah. You may not like the inter interpretation, but it is an interpretation the Gemara often, often gives. La dafka, we might say, we were putting into Yiddish. Don't take it so literally. The Gemara Mishnah means to say this is an illustration of what is a normal case in the real world. But even in an abnormal case, the halacha would be the same. The word tinokas is meant to restrict the halacha about immediately eating to the estrog of, of a young child. It applies to your own personal adult estrog as well. Or you can take the more didactic approach that the Mishnah means exactly what it says. And that, I guess, most, mostly appeals to us. That if the Mishnah said Tinokas, it means only of the Tinokas. But if you find an adult esteric, no, you've got to leave it until the end of the day. You may only make use of the esteric straight away if it's a child's esteric, but if it's an adult, you have to wait till the end of the day. If you say that, you have to tell me why there should be a difference in halacha between a child's esteric and an adult esteric. You don't get away with it if you can't give a reasoning for it. But maybe the Mishnah is just telling you that you can only eat immediately the esteric of a child. So now let's see how the, this is going to be the discussion, indeed, the, the um, to and fro between Rabbi Yochan and Reish Lakish. Does the word tinokus mean only tinokus, or does it actually mean, is the example the Mishnah used, but it can include an adult as well. So let's go back again. The Gemara says there's a kasha. Reish Lakish asked the kasha of Yochanan. It said, This is so, Reish Lakish is actually um, going to use it, this Mishnah, his way in a more difficult interpretation. He's a bit naughty. Let's see what he actually says. So Reish Lakish says, it says, So it says Reish Lakish, he takes the non-literal, literal, non-didactic way of reading the Mishnah. My love, who are din ligdolim, don't you agree with me, Rabbi Yochanan, even though the Mishnah employed the word tinokis, which looks like that the halacha applies only to tinokis, it doesn't mean me, doesn't intend you to come to that conclusion, but it intends you to conclude the halacha is even the same for gedolim, even for adults as well. And why does it say tinokus? Maybe because that's the normal situation. You know, you put your esrog away in a box, but your kid's playing with it. What's your kid's going to do? Your kid's holding an esrog. He's finished his, his din of chinuch. You know, he might start to abuse it in a way which pasnish, which is not appropriate. So you take his esrog away. And that's why it's, it's put in the form of tinokus. Not because it ex applies exclusively, says Reish Lokish, don't you agree with me that the word tunoka shouldn't be taken to particularize to this halacha, to the case of children, but it even applies to adults, which shows that as soon as the mitzvah is done, even an adult mitzvah, the esrig is no more muktza anymore. And that's what I'm saying. According to you, you shouldn't be able to eat it until the night at the end of the day. So I'm right, says Reish Lokish. So of course, Reish Lokish says, so Rabbi Yochanan would answer, no, Tinoko's dafka. It only, it means what it says. In other words, the other side of the coin of interpreting a particular scenario in a Mishnah. It is not particular to that case. It is particular to that case. Not like Rish Lakish wanted to say. Rabbi Yochanan says it's particular to that case. Only a child's estrogen. But you wouldn't be able to take an, a, an adult esrog. An adult esrog, I don't mean the esrog is adult, but he belongs to an adult. An adult esrog, you have to wait to the end of the day. The Mishnah that applies over it su su suggests that the, um, the esrog may be eaten immediately only applies to the esrog of a child. Now tell me why. That's all very well. And it answers the kasha against Rabbi Yochan, but why should there be a difference between the esrig of a child and the esrig of an adult? If the child was using the lul of an esrig, 
<clears throat> Surely that, that lulav and esrik was not so while it was being used as a mitzvah for the child. The child also has a mitzvah, has a mitzvah of chinuch, even though he's below bar of us mitzvah, he was she, has a mitzvah of chinuch. So really you should say that that esrik is just as out of bounds if it belonged to the child, as if it belonged to an adult. So why all of a sudden oh, would we interpret the Mishnah to make a difference between a child and an adult? The Gemara doesn't answer this question, it expects you to find it obvious. So the Rishonim say, the only way you can understand this is to say <coughs> that when we're dealing with the Esrik of a child, it was never really 100% Mukta all the way through Sukkot, even on the second day and the third day and the fourth day. Why? Because even though the child has a mitzvah of lulav and esrik, if he understands the mitzvah, there's already this educational mitzvah of chinuch. That is not a, if you like, it doesn't bind him min ha to that mitzvah. It is a practice mitzvah. He's practicing so that when he is bar mitzvah, when she is bas mitzvah, they will be familiar with a lulav and esrik, which means that really the lunar Vanessa of a child was never properly mukta so all the way through, which says uh, Rabbi Yochanan is why the you can you can snatch the esrik of the child immediately after he's made his last bracha. That last bracha he made on the seventh day he need to make because it was chinuch it was part of education. His educational mitzvah is over now. There was never really a label of of mukta on this because it wasn't the real mitzvah of. Arba minim that he had to do, it was really practice of Arba minim. It's not the same thing. An adult who have a mitzvah to do something has that mitzvah on themselves. It's incumbent upon them. A child, it only incumbent on the parent to uh, bring his child into the practice of a mitzvah. But that's not the mitzvah. Uh, it's not the mitzvah command of the mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to be educated, if you like. That doesn't impose the label of Mokza, which is why you may take the esrig of the child and eat it straight away. That's what our mission is meant to say. And Rabbi Ophan said, however, it says nothing about an adult. When it comes to an adult mitzvah, it is 100% um, Mokza, because it was hooked to the mitzvah of our Minim. And therefore, says Rabbi Ophan, I maintain my view that it only becomes eatable, if you like. You may only start to make use of that esrig for other purposes at the end of the day. Okay, so we have, both of them can defend themselves. Rabbi Yochan Reish Lachish, there's going to be another version of this in a moment. It just depends how you want to learn out this word Tinokas. Do you say it is Dafka? It means that and nothing else, children only. Or do you say it's only a demonstration of a typical situation? It's a scenario the Mishnah is using, the editor of the Mishnah, but it's not the only one. It's not meant to be particular to that of children. Depending how you read this Mishnah, you can either work with Rabbi Yochanan or Reish Lokish, right? So they both at the moment live on, if you like. Can you eat this esrik straight away if it's an adult? Or can you not? Machlokas Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lokish. Now there's obviously a halacha somewhere, but at this point the Gemara hasn't come to a conclusion. Let's just go on a little bit in the Gemara. The Gemara says, Ikadomri, just stop sharing for a moment. Ikadomri, there's another version of this question and answering answer that we've just seen between um, Rabbi Yochan and Reish Lakish, which is the inverse to the one we just mentioned. The logic is exactly the same. It, you know, if you have two people arguing um, and one answers somebody else's question, you can always invert it. Imagine the other person was asking the opposite question, if you like, and, the, and then the, and that person will answer. This, the, 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 the version we can bring now is simply, um, uh, another version of the dialogue between Rabbi Yochan and Reish Lakish, but exactly the same principles apply. Is A asking the question to B and using the Mishnah as his ammunition, or really was it B asking the question to A and using the Mishnah, the Mishnah in a different way as his ammunition? So let's read this Ikat Omri. Ikat Omri means there is another, others say there's another version that Asave Rabbi Yochan and the Reish Lakish. The previous version said that Reish Lakish asked the Kasher against Rabbi Yochan, saying the Mishnah is like me, and Rabbi Yochan gave a defense. This version says it's the other way around. Um, Rabbi Yochan asked the Kasher against Reish Lakish and brought the Mishnah in his defense. 
and Reish Lakish had to answer. So let's see how it works. Igadomri, Asave Rabbi Yochum Reish Lakish. When we read our Mishnah, and our Mishnah said, Miyav Tino Kishom Tinezulavehen, for Ochlin is Esrogehen, it said from a child, you take away the Lulav and you may even eat their Esrogim immediately after the mitzvah has been performed on the seventh day. Don't you agree with me, says Rabbi Yochanan, because this is his view, Tinokos in Gedolim Lo, that you should take the mitzvah seriously, the Mishnah seriously and literally, and say it only applies to children and not to adults, which means when it comes to an adult, you'd have to wait to the end of the day. That's Rabbi Yochanan's view. So answers the Gemara, he says, Lo, who are din filu gedolim. I say that the um, use of the word tinokus, says um, uh, Reish Lokish, even means um, gedolim, even adults as well. Bahai de Ketani Tinokos, the reason that the Mishnah only mentioned children, Tinokos, Urcha de Milsa Ketani is what I said to you before. It's the way of the world that a person snatches away immediately after the mitzvah the Lord of an Escrip from his little kids, because otherwise they'd probably play basketball with the Escrip or whatever it is, which would be uh, an insult to the Escrip. And that's the that's reason it uses the word take it away straight away from, from the child and you may eat it. But you could do the same to your own, but you probably wouldn't be in a hurry to do it because you can trust yourself not to play basketball. So this is exactly the same logic. Um, just coming, for, the, the boot was on the other foot over here. Uh, and it leaves us with this machlokus rabbi yochanan shlokish that whether you may eat it straight away, whether you, win, whether you have to wait until the end of the day. <clears throat> I think we actually passed it like rabbi yochanan over here, that you have to wait until the end of the day at least not straight away after the mitzvah. And therefore it becomes very much more similar to the type of muktzah we're used to on Shabbos, where if something's muktzah at the beginning of the day, it remains muktzah. It doesn't suddenly become not muktzah at two o'clock in the afternoon. It remains muktzah until Motsi Shabbos. Over here as well, as far as the halakha is concerned, as Rabbi Yochman says, you wait until the end of the day, even though the mitzvah has been completed earlier on. Okay. Now the Gemara, let me just stop sharing for a moment. I'm not, I have stopped sharing, haven't I? Okay. Amele Rapopo le Abaye. Now Rapopo asks a question to Abaye. I told you before, let's not focus on sukkah. Do you remember we, 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 we brought this rather strange rule that even though, even according to Rabbi Yochanan, and he said that you have to wait to the end of the day um, for, um, for the esrit, to be able to make use of the esrit, you have to wait until the end of the day. When it comes to the sukkah, the sukkah is asa even on the eighth day. It's not enough to wait to the end of the seventh day. There's no symmetry over here. For, for, for no obvious reason, there is a difference in the halacha, as quoted by Rabbi Yochanan, between lulav and esrog and sukkah. When it comes to an esrog he held at the end of the seventh day, which is the end of the period of the Chag of Sukkot, you may now take your Esrit and do what you will, because although it was Hukta the Mitzvah during Yontav, Yontav has come to an end. It is no more Sukkot Yontav. Shemini Atzeris is irrelevant. It's another Yontav. So therefore, you can now eat the Esrit. But if that's the case, why is it that you're not allowed to make use of the fallen planks of the Sukkah? Shemini Atzeris is already a Yontav in itself. Sukkah doesn't apply. So why does he say you have to wait until the end of the eighth day, until the end of Shemini Atzeres, before you can make use of the sukkah? There is no earthly reason because of hooks and a mitzvah anymore. Surely there is no, there's no way that a mitzvah of, of sukkah applies on the evening of Shemini Atzeres. It should have been fine to make use of those bits of wood as soon as the night of Shemini Atzeres came in. Why is there a differential here between sukkah and lulav? No reason for it. So Gamar is going to give us a reason. It's an interesting reason. So let's see this again. Omale Rapopo la Baye. Rapopo says to Baye, Le Rabbi Yochanan, Maish no Sukkah, Maish no Esrog. What is the difference between Sukkah and Esrog? The way the, the Gamar asked the question. Why do we have to wait to the end of Shemini Atzeres even before we can start to make use of um, the Sukkah material? When we could already start making use of Esrog at the end of seventh, um, at the end of Sukkot itself at the beginning of Shemini Atzeres. 
So Amale. So Abai answers Akasha. This is Abai's um, rationale of the reason for this difference between Lulav and Sukkah in the view of Rabbi Yochanan. Abai isn't Rabbi Yochanan. He's answering for Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan, this is again, we're talking about intergenerationally. Um, remember that Abai is something like third to fourth century uh, of a common area, era, and Rabbi Yochanan the second. So we're talking about 100, 150 years between them. But nevertheless, um, uh, Abaye is going to give an answer, which he thinks is the answer Rabbi Yochanan would have, been, would have given himself for why he made a difference between um, Esrig and Sukkah. So he says, Sukkah de Chazia ben Hashmoshes, de i Isrami leisa udosa, boiler mesa begava u mechel begava, de iskatsoi ben Hashmoshes. Well, that's the full answer he gives over here. It's a bit, a bit of a, uh, a mouthful. Um, I've um, swatted it all at once, really. I've, I've, otherwise, we're dealing with little bits of it, and it makes it more difficult. He has actually quite a simple differential when it comes to it between the din of Sukkah and the din of Arab Aminin. And his differentiation is this. And there are, there are questions in relation to this differentiation, but let's just see, see it at the face value. What is he trying to say? He says, you know something? He says, when it comes to the mitzvah of Sukkah, it doesn't necessarily end as soon as... Um, we get to Ben uh, Hashmoshes um, of Shmini Atzeres. In other words, at the end of the full day of Sukkot, the mitzvah of Sukkah doesn't actually necessarily, under all circumstances, come to an end. There's still a possibility of sitting in the Sukkah into Shmini Atzeres, or at least into a Sophic quasi Shmini Atzeres. And therefore, it's going to be more, so the whole of Shmini Atzeres, because since when Shmini Atzeres came in, there is still a reason to sit in the sukkah. It is hooked to the mitzvah at the beginning of Shmini Atzeres, it becomes Muktza for the whole of Shmini Atzeres. However, when it comes to Lulav and Esrik, there is never any scenario of the Lulav and Esrik being in use at the end of the sukkah's period and into Ben Ashmoshes of, of Shmini Atzeres. What are, what, are, what are the scenario that you may extend your sukkah sitting, if you like, past the end of the real day of sukkahs into Shmini Atzeres? So he says, what will happen if um, you were sitting in the sukkah? Let's say it's the end of sukkah's day almost, right? Sukkah's motzi yontav is going to be at eight o'clock. And it's sunset at seven o'clock, let's say. Ben is seven o'clock to eight o'clock. It's this strange period, which is considered to be Sophic Yom, Sophic Lila, which is why when we take in Shabbos, we take in Shabbos already at the beginning of Ben Hashemoshes, because since it's a Sophic, we have to be Lechumrah, and therefore we stop doing work early, even though it's very light outside still, so we'll see the sun. But we don't give up Shabbos until the stars are out. It's uh, the fact that we don't want to get it wrong. Since we don't know the status, is it Shabbos or not Shabbos, between sunset and stars out, we take Shabbos in earlier. That it is a Sophic period, which is neither here or there in Halacha. That's the status of Enoch It's been a question of which part, which hours, or which, which period of time really is Enoch Moshes. But in principle, if you know when Enoch Moshes is in, it has a, this Halachic Sophic attached to it. Does it belong to the day before, or does it belong to the day after? Right? Because the sun's already down, or is almost down, but the stars aren't quite out. Right, so it's nishtahin nishtaher, and therefore we deal with it in this sophic way. So it says uh, Abaye, let's think about sukkahs. We have um, sunset at seven o'clock on the last day of sukkahs. We have stars out at eight o'clock. So between seven and eight, we're in a Ben Ashmoshes period. It's neither really the last day of sukkahs, nor is it really Shmini Atzeres, or you could look at it another way. It is both the last day of Sukkot, possibly, and it's also possibly 
the beginning of the evening of Shmini Atzeris. Very problematic, isn't it, really? So he says, supposing a guest came, you were sitting down, you were almost ready to say goodbye to the sukkah, and then a guest came, and he's hungry. What would you do? He wants something to eat. Can you take him inside into the house? Not really, because it might still be sukkahs. Suffolk sukkahs, isn't it? He has to eat in the sukkah. So you're going to begin a meal. You're going to begin a meal for him during Ben Ashmoshes. That meal is going to take him all the way through Ben Ashmoshes, maybe even a few minutes into, suk into Shmini Atzeris, maybe an hour into Shmini Atzeris of evening. So what have you suddenly found yourself into? You've found yourself into using the sukkah in a mitzvah way, even though sukkah has ended, possibly. Which means, once you're using it and Ben Hashmoshes into the day of Shmini Atzeris, it becomes muksa in principle for the whole of Shmini Atzeris. And even though you may not be doing this, since it's possible that a person may arrive, and he may want to start a meal, and he may want to start a meal during the Ben Ashmashas period, it means that that sukkah is formally muqsa until the end of Shmini Atzeris. So that's, the, that's why you can't use that sukkah at all or any material to the end of Shmini Atzeris, because there is a possibility that that is still halakhically being used as a mitzvah at the beginning of Shmini Atzeris during Ben Ashmashas. Contrast that with the Lulav and Esri, says Abaye. There isn't a situation where you would be taking Lulav and Esrik on the seventh day of Sukkot towards the end of the seventh day of Sukkot during Bein Hashemoshes. There isn't. You wouldn't have taken it in the morning. The difference being the Lulav is a one-time mitzvah. You've taken it in the morning. You fulfilled the mitzvah probably during, during your davening. You put it down. Sukkot is not like that at all. Every body time somebody comes in for a meal, it's a Lama mitzvah. That's why you have a possibility of someone coming in and Ben Hashemoshes, and all of a sudden the sukkah is performing a function almost into Yontif of Shmini Atzeris, and therefore it's got to be muksa for the whole of Shmini Atzeris. The Lulav is never in that situation. It is out of use as soon as you've done your, uh, your mitzvah earlier on in the morning, and therefore it's not going to be in any use during Ben Hashemoshes leading into Shmini Atzeris, and therefore it'll be completely permitted at the end of the seventh day. Right? Isn't that, is that clear? The difference between the sukkah, which can, so to speak, carry over into Ben Hashemoshes, and therefore it has to even be muqsa during Shmini Atzeris, whereas the lulav is not going to ever be used in Shmini Atzeris at the end of the seventh day, and therefore it'll only need to be muqsa until the end of the seventh day. But I do have a question over here, and the Rishonim also have a question. <laughs> supposing, and you weren't feeling well in the morning of the seventh day of Sukkot, and you slept during the day, and when you woke up, it was almost Ben Ashmoshos at the end of the seventh day, you suddenly panic, I'm feeling better now, right, my sleeping bill has finally expired, I can get up, I want to make a bracha on my Lord of Esri, I haven't made a bracha on the seventh day yet, and it's now Ben Ashmoshos. Are you allowed to make a bracha? On the one hand, it sounds a bit like Oliver Twist, uh, whatever it is. On the, or is it fiddle on the roof? On the one hand, it might still be Sukkot, because it's in this difficult period of Ben Ashmoshes, which is Suffolk Sukkot. I can quickly make my bracha. On the other hand, it might already be Shmini Atzeris. It's a Suffolk period. I can't make a bracha, a little bit of Shmini Atzeris, a bracha of Atola. I'd be saying I've got a mixed mitzvah of well, Arba Minim to do, and it's not Sukkot anymore. What do I do? Well, if it's a mitzvah, if it's it's not going to be, if you were at the time of the base Amikdash, actually, it would be a mitzvah in a Torah, and if it's a mitzvah in a Torah, you probably would make it in Ben Ashmoshes, in which case it would be the same as the situation of the sukkah. You could say there is a possibility of using the lulav and esrek in a situation, you know, of an onus where a force majeure, you weren't able able to do it earlier in the day. So therefore, maybe it should also be muktzah, the whole of the shmini atzeris, because you may may still be able to to carry over your mitzvah, which you forgot to do in the morning during the twilight period um, leading into Shemini Atzeris. So that's a possible question. If you say that, it's the same as Sukkah. And therefore, it should be, be muktza the whole of Shemini Atzeris as well. Anyway, that question is asked. It's not a terribly good question because it, it still remains um, a general fact that a sukkah is a mitzvah you encounter any time you have a meal, and that could go through right through the day, whereas generally, one makes a brocha on the sukkah, 
uh, on the Lullivan Estric earlier on in the day. Having done so, there's no need ever for a repeat. So uh, that's really the, what a buy is giving the, as the difference between the two, which is why the sukkah will remain, the sukkah material, this is halacha uh, as well, remains mukta until the end of Shemuni Yatzeris. So if something falls down off the sukkah and um, it is now Shemini Yatzeris and you see it, you can't say, hey, sukkah is over, this mukta the mitzvah is gone, so I can now use it as a, as a cricket bat or something like that. You're not allowed to do that. It's still mukta until the end of the eighth day. But the, we, we hold like Rabbi Yochanan, that when it comes to eating the estrogen, you could do so at the end of the seventh day, not immediately after you've done the mitzvah on the seventh day, but at the end of the seventh day. Okay. The Gemara just goes on now to give a, a, another opinion and then to, to bring all sorts of names into the equation. They're not gonna bother us very much. And let's just do this quickly. There's no, um, there's no really thought involved. Let's just read it. The Levi Oma, Levi is another Amora. Levi has a different view. His name was Levi, right? That was his name, sorry. You know, he doesn't have one of these long names. His name was Levi. Was he a Levi? Probably. Anyway, he's, he, he's, he comes up quite often in, in Shas as, as having an opinion, quite an early Amora. He says the following. Esrug afilu bashmini osa. Well, he takes this view uh, that an esrug is osa right to the end of the eighth day. I just convinced you that it doesn't need to be. Sukkah is osa until the end of the eighth day, but 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 the um, esrug only to the end of the seventh day. We don't follow Levi in halacha, but the Gemara brings him in just to show that there is a third opinion uh, that it's osa until the end of the eighth day. Now the Gemara also says. Shmuel's father said, it's often quoted, uh, Esrog on the seventh day is Osa, Bashmini Muta, but on the eighth day it is Muta. That was like Rabbi Yochman. Come Avua de Shmuel, the Shitta say the Levi. And then the Avua de Shmuel, Shmuel's father, changed his mind and took on the opinion of Levi, who said it's Osa until the end of the eighth day. And then the Gemara says, Come Rabbi Zera. Rabbi Zerif got up and he changed his view, and changed to the view of Udishmuel. This sounds like a relay race or past the parcel where people are changing positions on when you can start to eat your esrik. To Amr Rabbi Zerif, esrik shenivsala, osa la kol shiva, that it's osa all seven days. So let's ignore who went and did what. The most important things to remember are that we have several views on when the estrogen may be eaten. Um, in summary, really, over here, there are three views. As far as the sukkah is concerned, there's only one view, and that is that you cannot make use of the material of the sukkah until the end of Shemini Atzeres. However, as far as the estrogen is concerned, there are really three views. There is the view that you could eat the estrogen straight away after the mitzvah is done. That's the most lenient view, or lenient, I mean, the most immediate view. You, as soon as the, your, you performed your final action of mitzvah on the seventh day, it's already mutzah. That's view number one. View number two is you have to wait until the end of the seventh day, which is the one I say is ahalacha, the end of the seventh day of sukkahs, only until motse sukkahs itself. And the third view is this, that you can't even make use of the esreg until the end of shmini atzeris. Three views. Okay. <clears throat> That's the end of this particular piece of discussion relating to, um, to Muqtza um, in relation to the, um, um, the Lulav and Esrik and, um, and Sukkah. And it's given us an overview also to the general idea of Muqtza. I'm not, I don't want to go on to the next piece um, because it's a, 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 on a completely different Indian with me moving away from Muqtza, moving away from Brochus. <clears throat> Just to say that um, when it comes to Muqtza, um, Sometimes mukta is in the mind, as I mentioned to you as some examples before, the intention affects mukta in some situations, which is one, one reason for defending the idea that as soon as you've done the mitzvah, the mukta disappears. When, the idea of mukta in some ways is that when Yontav comes in or when Shabbos comes in, Ben Ashmosho, so to speak, if, if you knew that something can't be used, then you can't use it. Even if you have a reason to use it later on, it's in the mind. The mind at the beginning of the day determines whether it's what, what's called muhan, whether it is ready for you to use later on. 
That applies to certain types of mortar. As I say, it's not going to apply to a pneumatic drill. I can't say to myself, well, you know, for the first three hours of Shabbos, I've decided I'm not going to use a pneumatic drill, but from then on, it's all right. So now I can use it after three hours. You can't do that. But there, are, there is this view there that says that if something's a muktzah mitzvah, so you only know that you're, not, you're only going to use your shabbos candles while they're lit, then why not be able to carry them around after they lit? Your intention was only that this was set aside for the shabbos candles, for the fire, during those hours that it was lit. That's the view, really, that, that muktzah can, can affect, can be affected by the intention. A more famous idea is that stones normally are muktza, which means if some, because they have no use, they really have no, no normal use. Something that's no normal use is out of your mind. You don't have in your mind when Shabbos comes in that you're going to use a stone. I mean, you'd have to be very crazy uh, or, you know, uh, shall we say, uh, <clears throat> very desperate to have that sort of intention that whatever is there, you might want to use. You don't. There's, there's normally, there's your, there's, there's your world of implements that you're likely to use in Shabbos. And a stone is outside your world of implements. However, if when Shabbos came in, you saw a particular stone just before Shabbos came in, and you said, that stone I want to use on Shabbos, then all of a sudden it's not muktzah. That stone, if you haven't had that intention, would have been muktzah. But because you had the intention to use it as a door stopper, that same, stop, that same stone is not, it's not uh, muktzah. Because your intention has created it in it a status of being usable. It becomes an implement which is usable. And it's all in the mind. And <laughs> it's really usable for you. Somebody else hasn't made it usable. But you've made it usable. You may now use it as, as, as a doorstop. So for, so someone, for, so, yeah. for someone else, it would be muktzah then? Yes, for somebody else, it would be muktzah because it was only for you. Only you had the intention to, to use it. But it is. it, it, it used to be something that was um, practically uh, in place. It's discussed a lot in the Gemara. Um, because they didn't have all the functionalities and items of functionality that we have today. We have something for everything. And therefore, because we have something for everything, everything we look at carries a, a purpose and we know we're, we're likely to use it. The, crazy, the most, um, shall we say, unpalatable situation the Gemara discusses this in great length, uh, where a stone might be used. I give you an example as a door stopper, right? Nowadays, most of us have door stoppers. So we don't normally have in mind that if I need, I think I might need a door stopper on Shabbos, I'm going to use this stone. Therefore, for us, it's muktzah. Whereas in the old days, people were always looking at things and saying, that's not going to be muktzah <clears throat> because I will need to use it for a particular purpose because they didn't have the full set of tools and equipment available to them. And the Gemara discusses the use of stones for bodily cleanliness. After, um, after a person goes to the toilet, for example, they didn't used to have toilet paper. For us, stones are never in the mind for use to clean ourselves off with after we've, um, we've been to the toilet and relieved ourselves. But in times of the Gemara, this was a major problem. How do you maintain bodily cleanliness after going to the toilet and not having paper and not necessarily even having rags? Rags were too valuable. They would find clean stones and those stones would be put to use. But they would only really be able to put them to use if they had in mind that they'd set them aside for that sort of usage. Again, mind over matter. Um, for us, almost, there is no use for this sort of thing. The same way as nowadays on Pesach, we have every type of food. We don't have to make things anymore. You know, we have, uh, we have forms of bread, which are now, uh, which look like bread. We have pizza, which is, which is kosher to Pesach and everything else. Well, you know, we don't have to do, we don't have to resort to the limited uh, a limited um, <clears throat> array of, of what we can use. But in those days, that'd be more ingenious. And so they had to make things out of muktzah by giving them an intention before Shabbos came in. Okay, next week we'll carry on. Please God and the Gemara. The Gemara is going to be talking about some other aspects of, of the Lulu Vanessary. So thank you for joining me. Thanks. See you again. I'm just going to stop recording one moment.